Welcome everybody. This is the monthly market update for September 2021. If you guys want to check out past episodes, you can go to simplepassivecashflow.com slash investor letter. And we are going to be going over some teaching points and some articles that I've stumbled across over the past. Some freebies for you guys. If you guys are interested in learning more about this thing we've been talking about quite a bit, infinite banking from yourself. What the heck is this? Why do the wealthy do this? Why does Lane say it's not for people under a quarter million, half a million dollars net worth? Come and check it out on Saturday, September 4th from 9 a.m. to 11 Pacific time. If you can't make it, shoot me an email at lane at simplepassivecashflow.com. I'll send you the recordings, but we'll also be put a page for you guys together, which you guys can access at simplepassivecashflow.com slash banking. And also my book is coming out. If you guys want to help me out with the review, shoot me an email and I'll get you guys access to that. Just finished up the audio book. I know how you guys are. Another book, you can listen to it on 2x speed and you can probably knock it out in four to five hours. This is a story about a dude named Lane. Then one day he went and tried to rent them out and then he became one of the best of me. What is infinite banking? What do you do it? Well, this is why we do it. Take an example, somebody stuffs a hundred grand in there. Create this phenomenon where you bank from yourself for infinite banking, where you now you're able to take a pretty substantial loan against your policy. Now you put that into other investments, such as syndications, private placements, rental properties. Should something happen in life, you're able to take the money out. That's where that little cone comes in. That's in the middle of the road. You have you're generating income within the policy. The policy grows tax-free, and that's why we're using the life insurance as a loophole here, guys. Um, you also enjoy the benefits of asset protection with it being uh, life insurance, and uh, you stop worrying how to grow your wealth and worry about teaching the next generation how to do all this stuff. Uh, if you guys haven't met me before, uh, my name is Lane Kaoka. Grew up in Hawaii. Was in Seattle from 2003 to 2017. Got a couple engineering degrees, but more importantly, started uh, investing in 2009. 2015, I had 11 rentals, but as of late, I've been more involved in private placements and syndications. Currently, over 6,000 units now. Uh, working on our 37, 38th project. I also have a podcast, Simple Passive Cash Flow, and for those of you guys who like the shorter form, Quick Tip Podcasts, you can check that out. Quick Tips, I think it's Quick Financial Tips from the Rich Uncle. If you go want to go and search that on iTunes and Google Play. But let's have at it. A teaching point. This is a chart of different cap rates in different markets. Now, of course, you could probably break down, take one market like Dallas in dozens of different sub-markets and asset classes and different classes of assets such as A, B, and C, D class. But this is just comparing geographic locations. San Francisco, New York, LA, San Jose, Portland are have some of the lowest cap rates, which means is you don't get the yields there, which also means that it's a lot more stable. This is where a lot of the insurance companies will invest. So they're going more for capital preservation. But we as investors, we're obviously not going to the higher cap areas. So these are all major markets. If you're in more of a tertiary market that's smaller, you'll probably see caps more in the five to 7% range. You'll probably be talking over a pull down ton at that point. These, there's different ranges of these markets. The lower the cap, Basically, it means the more stable the market is, but that doesn't necessarily where the better returns are. Obviously, the places that we like to invest are in the middle of there. Good solid markets, but still good cap rates so we can get yield. For more information about this, check out the guide at simplepassivecashflow.com slash syndication. And uh, we've got about 12 people checking in now on the live feed. This also gets put on the podcast form and the YouTube so you guys can enjoy all the cool pretty pictures. And I have access to the comment feed. If you guys want to ask live questions as we go along, feel free to do so. Somebody told me this on one of the uh, investor calls this past month, the Dunning-Kruger effect. It's uh, kind of starts off like this, where you don't know what you don't know, and you realize that you don't know. And then you start to hit a point, an inflection point, where you really start learning and eventually head off to the mastery. Now, a lot of people, they still invest in their 401ks, Roth IRAs, and supposedly low fee ETFs, that's I'd say you don't know. This is like the 529s, they're just investment plans for the clueless in my opinion. Get educated, check out more of our content, and here's a text theme. It's made to be a joke. You guys or you gals are always trying to get your spouses to read that 
purple book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Just tell them that your ex stopped by your work today and then they're going to get their attention. And then you hit them with, she wanted you or he wanted you to read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Happy face. Anyway, moving on. The difference between sophisticated investors and accredited investors really isn't much. There's a lot of accredited investors that don't really know much. Typically, sophisticated investors you know, are more, but they have lower net worth. And that's where we want to get everybody. We want to get everybody to at least be semi-educated so they can make the right investment decisions for them. Ultimately, you guys own it. None of this in this presentation is supposed to be legal advice. If not, you're an idiot. <laughs> Let's face it. If you're going to take legal tax advice from some guy on the internet that happened to use the tactics for his advantage, you're an idiot. This is just for entertainment value. For sure, you go pay a CPA lawyer five, $600 per hour. Most of those guys haven't figured out how to leave their day jobs behind. One thing I wanted to point out this one, when you have a lot of LLC, you will get a lot of solicitations in the mail. A lot of you guys who own rental properties are probably hit up with dozens and dozens of yellow letters trying to get you to buy your house for pennies on the dollar because they think you're an idiot. I guess it works some of the time. Here are some correspondences I got from a LLC servicing company. It's confusing, I think, when you first get your LLC set up. You've got your registered agent, you've got the servicer, you've got the place your appeal box goes to, it can be confusing. And don't forget the old like, people who solicit you to get those stupid posters that you know post the minimum wage that you don't really need in my own opinion, but who am I to say? I think it's important to check up on who are these people sending you these bills and do you need to pay these? One thing that tipped me off or what I got attention to was you see on this left side, typically spoof emails will not address you by your first and last name. They'll give you a generic name, like here they say valued client. And then the first paragraph here is just scammy. And they're saying, congratulations, it's your company's first or anniversary. It's time to pay your bill for your annual dues. I eventually found out that this invoice was legit, but I am gonna use my other lawyer to just be my registered agent for me. So instead of paying 350 bucks, I'm gonna pay about $67 for LLC. Another plug for learn how the wealthy bank from themselves, go to simplepassivecashflow.com slash banking to sign up for the free e-course and the live training this coming weekend. And if you're catching up to this stuff late, go ahead and uh, sign up there so you can get you those videos. Now here is a flow chart that depicts when you do a HELOC or cash out. Now, the reason why I put this in here is a lot of people realize that yeah, I want to alternatively invest and get all that garbage in the 401k mutual funds. And maybe I've been doing some crypto, but that stuff is super risky at this point. I want to invest in real estate and other alternative investing and take control over my financial picture. Um, so you burn through your cash, right? Not many people have that much cash and I don't. I'm smart. I have it in my infinite banking policy where I keep my dry powder. But for most people coming in, they don't have that set up and they burn through their cash to invest, where do they go find their other 30, 50, $100,000 to invest? A lot of times it's either going to be in their primary residence or their rentals or their retirement funds. Typically, I would recommend people to go and rate the equity in their house or their rentals first before they go to the retirement funds, unless in some, some situations, the client will be like, I'm just freaked out about the stock market. What? You have good reason to be, because it's all fake money in there. They've been pumping that into the system. We could probably debate this for quite a while. Now, this flowchart helps you choose whether it's a HELOC or you're going to do a HELOC from your home equity, which is cool because it's reversible, right? Should you not like to alternate invest, you can put it right back into the house. You don't have to pay a lender that, that origination fee to get the cash out refinance which is on the right side. The HELOC is sort of reversible. The bad side about the HELOC is that if anything happens in the economy, the banks can pull those notes and pull the lines at any point where they cash out refinance. You've pulled that equity, they can't come after it after that. Different circumstances, I tell people, hey, do you wanna live in that house for more than five to 10 years? If that's the case, I would probably push you more towards this right side of getting the HELOC, or sorry, on this right side of getting the cash out refinance because it's more of a long-term thing. If they are going to be you know, living in the house for just a little bit longer, I'd probably lean them towards getting the HELOC and then just selling that house at some point.
But if you don't know, I would say maybe default would be HELOC first, just for a short, until you get proof of concept, then you tap the equity more permanently via cash out refinance. For more information about this in HELOCs, go to simplepassivecashflow.com slash HELOC. That's their uh, info page on that type of content. Uh, now getting into some of the headlines. Uh, jobless claims reached the fresh pandemic era low of 30. 348,000 unemployment is definitely coming down. Weird, I've been seeing a lot of like commercials trying to get people or hire people. Oh, we're looking for, you know, good people to work for us. I've never seen that in my lifetime where paid advertisement is going out to not for customers, but people that work at their freaking company. <laughs> I don't know, it's weird. Perhaps that means that companies want to burn up their PPP loans. I don't know, maybe that has to do with it, but I think People are looking for good people to hire at this point. Or I, I guess the other threat is people will like to complain that people are lazy sitting at home milking their unemployment checks, which yeah, we don't want to get into that argument today. Now, this is the census here. This is discussing the demographics change in different ethnic groups in some of the uh, biggest movers and shakers, Texas, Florida, California, Georgia, Washington. And if I were to summarize this for the people listening in podcast land, generally all these are five states. The population is going up. California is only going up by 6%. Texas, Florida, Georgia, Washington are going up by low double digits. But the biggest differential I see is the Hispanic population in those states are going up by 21 to 40%. White alone category here is staying pretty flat line and actually decreasing by 8% in California. You can see these other ethnic groups. I guess that the message are minorities are taking over and that's what's happening. Monthly report, this is from JP Morgan, the job tracker based on alternative data. This is the total employment. Overall, the trend is strong. It's been four months since we had the disappointing 269K report. In the report in early September is close to a million. The Fed could easily make the argument that goal of substantial further progress has been achieved, which means there isn't much of a reason to keep putting in stimulus, but they still, and the stuff that I've been hearing about quantitative easing, pumping fake money into the system is probably going to be going on for at least another quarter or two. If I was a gambling man, I'd probably say over a year at least, but uh, who knows? And I, I don't invest in stocks. So I don't really follow this stuff too much. Business org came up with this cool map with the best paying states for tech workers in 2021. A lot of you guys out there are computer programmers. Let's see the top. I'm going to read them out in terms of the top Washington best. I guess the average is 122 grand. Next is California at 116 grand. Number three is DC. Number four is Virginia. Number five is Massachusetts. Six is Maryland. 7 New Jersey, 8 New York, 9 Colorado. Those are your top 10. And for those of you guys who are just curious, Texas is at number 14, Georgia is number 19, Florida is kind of in the middle at 27. The ones that are bad, where, where are the non tech areas? Montana, North Dakota, Mississippi, Wyoming is dead last. Now, this is a chart uh, that we talk about quite often. It is modeling the uh, cap rate in the teal, which has been slowly coming down over the, the last decade. And this is where people kind of complain, right? Cap rate compression, yields are lowering. And this is what like drives me crazy. Like people are like, I'm not getting 130% return in five years. I'm only getting 110%. Dude, because the yields are generally going lower. This is it. why. The dark blue is the... 10 year treasury rate, which moves around with the interest rates. And for investors, I say this time and time again, it all is this teal minus the dark blue, which is the cap rate minus interest rate. That is the Delta that investors make the spread. And of course they apply leverage onto that to leverage that, that yield. And that is what investing is. They move up and down together. Interest rates go down, cap rates go down and people always freaked out that interest rates will go up, cap rates are going to go up. And if interest rates go up, the reason why they push it up or they let it go up is because the economy is doing really well. And therefore, if you own rental real estate or any assets, you'll probably be the beneficiary of some of that flow into the market and good economy. One thing I'd like to point out on this diagram 
to me, cap rate compression is when you have a temporary squeeze where it comes off of the historical averages where, say, in mid 2018, there was a bit of a squeeze right here in terms of how much delta there was or in terms of investor returns there were. The times when you want to get involved are around when there's a larger, healthier delta. Honestly, you can't really time that type of stuff. It is what it is. And by the time you're going into a deal, the market has probably moved a little bit anyway. But I think one thing is for certain, except for the 2006 to 2008 era, like you're always going to have the cap rates higher than the interest rates. I think that's just a fact of life. That's a basic fundamental. Cap rates lowering. Now this is comparing the major markets, the lower cap rate markets, like your San Francisco, Portland, Austin, Texas, like your, where you have your lower caps and your non-major markets where you typically have your higher caps. But overall, they're all coming down. But I think one thing, like if you look at this, yeah, it's coming down. I think you have good, stable cap rates for the most part. And again, here was that other slide we showed earlier with the, the lower cap rates area of places like San Francisco, New York, Los Angeles, San Jose, Portland, Austin, Boston, Seattle, places like that. Top five multifamily markets for rent growth. This is from Yardi Matrix. And in order, it is Boise, Phoenix, Spokane, Tampa, Inland Empire. But then I started to look at this chart and I started to call BS here because not all of these are major markets. And I put here in red, the population of these markets. Everybody talks about depends who you hang out with. I would say unsophisticated investors always talk a lot about Boise because it's jumping like crazy. But Boise is a really small market, guys. It's like a quarter of a million people. I think Hawaii is way bigger of a population, I think. Whereas Phoenix is a major market. 16, uh, 1.6 million people live in Phoenix. Spokane, Tampa are on this chart. And Spokane's even smaller than Boise at 217,000. Tampa's a little bigger but still under half a million population. To me, a major market is going to be at least half a million or definitely getting over a million. I think this is a bogus chart here. Inland Empire, shoot, what's Inland Empire? Do you like, do you call Rancho Cucamongo Inland Empire? Do you call Ontario, Ontario, California Inland Empire? I know certainly San Bernardino is Inland Empire, but they have about a quarter million population. Why do you guys call it Inland Empire? It's kind of like, oh, this is a bad imagery, but it's, oh, you go to the barber and then like you tell the bar barber's like, well, how far do you want me to cut down your neck? Like some people, they got, they got the hair going all the way down to their neck or their butt. It's the same thing. Where do you draw the line to get this data? But anyway, don't want to offend anybody, of course. People get really offended these days. But here's another chart, small and mid-side metros with the most economic growth in 2001. Read the small markets, mid-sized markets, and then the larger markets. The so small markets, again, you got to be careful investing in smaller markets because it's not as stable. I'm sure you can get a lot of yields there for the short term. Those would be Spartansburg, South Carolina, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, Sebastianboro, Beach, Florida, Winchester, Wyoming. Um, those are your small markets. Now your mid-sized markets, number one, Huntsville, Alabama, number two, Northport, Sarasota, Florida, three, Port St. Lucie, Florida, four, Boise City, Idaho, five, Hoover, Utah. And then your major markets, Number one, Nashville, Davidson, Franklin, Tennessee. Number two, Raleigh, North Carolina. Number three, Austin, Round Rock, Georgetown, Texas. Four, Jacksonville, Florida. Five, Orlando. Those are your top five for your large metros. I don't know how they came up with this composite score. It, it has to do with percent change in total employment, unemployment rate, average monthly building permits per 100,000, and average monthly home sales per 100,000. We talk a lot about the South and Midwest. They're landlord friendly states, good economic growth. But what are some of the Western markets? I'm not a big fan of investing in Western markets because they're typically more bluer states, and a little tougher for landlords out there. But Western states are getting beat up in the pandemic. Maybe the, the counterintuitive thing is from an, a stoic investor is to go in now. Right, maybe it's the time to go and do a development in New York City. Just saying. Those top Western markets for growth is Boise, Phoenix, Las Vegas, Tucson, Colorado Springs, Reno, Albuquerque, Salt Lake City, all with huge rent growth. You could probably make the argument that it, you know all the tide raises all boats. Uh, Arbor released their quarter two 2021 single family rental investment trends reports. This is not apartments. This is more single family homes. 
some of the key findings were occupancy rose to 95.3 percent highest level since 1994 vacant to occupied rent growth accelerated to 12.7 percent a record high and cap rates dipped to 5.8 percent amidst rising asset valuations there's a chart here showing single family loan to value ratios now my takeaway on this is i think everybody's like thinking, when is the bubble going to happen? And typically people who raise that question up on internet forum with Booker Pocket, people who's only been around for one and a half years and are freaked out because the prices went up in the last 12 months. One thing I look at is like the loan to value. Are people like over their head in debt? They're still in this band that they've typically been in between 63 and 68% loan to value. Granted, you could probably make the argument that the home equity values went up, so their loan to value goes down at least we're not seeing like that this thing spike because the scary thing is like when the loan to value spikes that's when you know that people are using debt like the unsophisticated people that don't invest for cash flow are going after debt and they think of the big short where the taxi drivers and the strippers are buying rental properties or just banking on appreciation now one thing that's is interesting here this chart investor percentage share of single family home purchases this is showing how much mom and pop investors are buying the stock out there versus the institutions. And this is going to be a story moving forward that the institutions are starting to get into the game of you know, residential real estate. Why? Perhaps it's something good to invest in. Whether it is, like, that's what the smart money is doing. So in 2000, investor share was a little lower in the, in the 3 to 4% range. That has peaked in 2011, where it went all the way up to 9%. But since 2011, it's been steadily declining, which is saying that it's probably the institutions are buying more of the stock that's coming out. Freddie Mac release, this is their interest rates. Um, you can get Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae loans, but you know, I think this is just a good indicator of what's out there or how historic rates are trending. These might not be the rates you're personally looking at, especially if you're working with a daisy chain lender that marks it up, whatever the heck they want. And this is like the relatively how interest I've been tracking. Earlier in the year, we hit a low and then things came back up, but we've been kind of selling back to those all time lows once again. Newer investors, they really freak out about interest rates going up by a tenth of a point. But like I said, you, know, you go look at that chart where the cap rates versus interest rates go up. So, look, investors like, cool, man. That means the, in the economy is doing well and my rents are going to be going up and my cap rates are probably going to be going up too. Uh, this is a chart showing the employment rebounding across all in industry. The takeaway is the leisure here got absolutely killed and is about, I want to say 60 to 70% of where it was pre pandemic, whereas government workers, unscathed healthcare, education, a lot of the in information, financial, professional services, most of these definitely took a hit, but nothing like the leisure sector. This is the stuff that you have to deal with when you're a rental property owner. Most of credit investors are like, why the heck would you want to own a rental property? It's a pain in the ass. Legal liability, just give me a syndication. And these are the exact reasons why. This is what changed. You know, That was a big occurrence for investors were rent extension, having to do rent forgiveness nonsense. They had to decrease their rents, miss payments, De decreasing rents. That's all like, it's all the commercial professional property managers that are just killing these tenants, in my opinion, with five to 10% rent growth. The mom and pop investors, to me, they just don't have the cojones or the market data to raise the rents where it should be. Uh, another reason why the mom and pop investor gets left behind. Deferred maintenance is a big thing. The, the only things that went down as a common occurrence were charging rent fees. They stopped doing that because they were desperate for renters and increasing rents, which is the inverse of decreasing rents. Fun things here from shopping center business, Taco Bell is releasing a new concept of drive through lanes here. So cool. It's got this like pink or purplish pink hue to it. New concept. It's a two story restaurant where you drive underneath it. And then at Jack in a Box, they're going to build 64 new restaurants as part of the 16 franchise development agreements across Arizona, California, Idaho, Texas, and Utah. So go Jack. Another thing that you guys might have seen is only fans. They're not going to allow sexually explicit content anymore. Their entire business model was gone. And this is the way I feel about short-term rentals. 
right? Everybody's like, I'm making a killing with this stuff. But short-term rentals are discretionary items. It's what people spend their money on in good times. And when in bad times or pandemics where you can't travel, it goes kaput. And just like how the government got rid of OnlyFans, sexually explicit material, the government can just remove and create some kind of law that takes them away. Do I think that is right? No, because I ultimately feel like it's the big hotel industry and the big players lobbying against Airbnb and VRBO people at the end of the day, but it is what it is. This is why I like to invest in boring workforce style housing. You guys want to get more into our inner circle, check out our family office, Ohana Mastermind to learn more. Go to simplepassivecashflow.com slash journey. It's all about who you know and building your peer network of other peer passive accredited investors. And again, if you guys want to check out my book, go to simplepassivecashflow.com slash book. You guys can help me out. We'll get you guys a copy when it comes out, but I need some help with people who want to give me some views. I'll go ahead and sign up there, shoot me an email. And this is the point where you guys can put in some questions into the chat box, but just some personal stuff I've been going on. So in terms of growth, yeah, I think everyone's got goals they're working on. I think things that like the way this year has been going, it's with the whole Delta pandemic and everything. It's just been a little slow. I've been forced to stay at home lately. So it's been a bummer. I want to see all you guys, how I've been making contribution back in the world. One little thing at a time, you guys asked for the infinite banking e-court. Here it is. Go get it it's for free. Simple slash banking. For those of you guys who make under 50, 60 grand a year and net worth under a quarter million, this is not for you. Do not waste your time with this stuff, right? This is more for the, the people with a little bit more dry powder and the higher net worth folks, but you can still get it for free. I mean, I know you guys like free stuff. Three significance here. If you guys haven't checked our Facebook groups, which are mostly on invite. I used to have calls with everybody when I first started to do these things. I slightly opened it up a bit. Um, a lot of people are inviting their friends, but you guys can join our Facebook group, um, the Pui Passive Real Estate Investor Ohana for sophisticated and credit investors there. And if you're in Hawaii, we've got arealoha.com for you guys to join up there. We've also got the subgroups. I think you guys can get these links at simplepassivecashflow.com slash networking. And if you haven't lately, go to simplepassivecashflow.com and check out all the little links at the top and go handle on that stuff. There's all, a lot of that stuff is for free, right? The whole point is that you guys don't spend your money on some stupid guru charging 10, 20, 30, $50,000 upcharge after upcharge. In terms of uncertainty, I'm a little worried that we may, I think we will, but we may not have the, the January retreat in 2022. Uh, if you guys want to get the latest on that, go to simplepassivecashflow.com slash 2022 retreat. I just had a call today. Unfortunately, we can't have it at Bishop Museum. That would have been cool. They're already booked, but here in Hawaii, there's a big Delta. We're getting our kind of our first wave in terms of COVID with it being the, the Delta variant. But my outlook is you know, the stoic philosophy of the obstacle is way, right? When you have uncertainty, when you're uncomfortable, that is typically when you're going to be hitting gold pretty soon. So suck it up. Good thing. Good days are ahead. One thing I like that has uncertainty in my life is the one thing I can count on is whether interest rates go up or down or even go up, which is some people think is bad. The cap rates usually bounce along with it. And as investors, the cap rate is usually higher than interest rate is which you borrow and then you apply leverage via good leverage. That is how we make money folks. It is simple as that. And that allows me to have some certainty in this crazy world. I've been hearing a lot of you guys, most of, I guess half of the people coming into our tribe these days are off a of referral. So I really appreciate you guys telling your friends about simple passive cash flow. I think a lot of you guys feel my pain where people think you're crazy and I call them muggles. If you, if you watch the, not the Lord of the Rings, but Harry Potter, muggles are like the, the non magic wizard people, right? They're the people, the regular people, they're the non-believers in a way. So don't worry about the muggles. A lot of my friends are muggles. That's cool. But if you guys realize that there's a better way of doing this without the high fee, a lot of middlemen. 401k, mutual fund, give your money to a financial planner who doesn't really know anything that get, just gets paid off commission. Join our tribe and join our club at simplepassivecashflow.com slash club. Some things I've been buying for doodads. I bought this like Bose sleep buds. I tried out for one night 
I think I might return this thing. I don't think it's the greatest. I got desperate. I got a three month year old. I don't get much sleep. So I got desperate and bought it. But who knows? I probably be, be, might be returning it. But anyway, if you guys want to get the, I released a free basic financial e-course. Probably better for the kids. If you guys got basic financial skills, this thing would probably be pretty basic for you guys. But if you guys want it, go to three, text the word basic to 314-665-1767. And for those of you guys who want to get access to the free remote investor light course, you can text the word, you guessed it, remote to 314-665-1767. Tell your friends. Again, none of this was made to be legal advice. Please think for yourself and we'll see you guys. This website offers very general information concerning real estate for investment purposes. Every investor situation is unique. Always seek the services of licensed third-party appraisers and inspectors to verify the value and condition of any property you intend to purchase. Use the services of professional title and escrow companies and licensed tax, investment, and or legal advisor before relying on any information contained herein. Information is not guaranteed as in every investment there is risk. The content found here is just my opinion and things change and I reserve the right to change my mind. Above all else, do your own analysis and think for yourself because in the end, you are the only person who is going to look out for your best interests.